Hi, welcome to another Behind the Line with me, Chef Danny Davis. Cuisine, collab and cocktails. We'll be talking to some of the hottest shot chefs around. Hi, another episode of Behind the Line with Chef Danny Davis. Today we're here at LMC with uh, Chef Patricia Clark. Nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you. How are you doing? Thank you. Fist pump. I'm um, great. You're here now on a, on a boat at the moment. I am. I'm on Motor Yacht Ocean Club. And that's having some work done, hence why you're in LMC. We are just wrapping up a yard period where some things have gotten tightened up and fixed, and I'm excited to get the charter season going. Awesome. Um, yeah. So uh, how did you become a, a chef to start off with, and then how did you kind of get into yachting? Uh, how I became a chef is very... Um, organic and simple in a way I did not start out thinking I would be a chef I went into the finance industry I went to finance yeah straight out of college and I was living in San Francisco not making any money yet and I wanted to meet people and I didn't have money to go to all the fancy bars and restaurants so if I met somebody interesting I would invite them over for the only thing I knew how to make at the time, which was spaghetti. Spaghetti. Real straight up spaghetti out of a box. <laughs> <laughs> I was not a chef in any way. So I would invite people over for spaghetti. It became very popular. Suddenly 60 people were showing up within a month to eat spaghetti. And very quickly I was making other things than just spaghetti for like the mayor's office and the opera house. Oh, fantastic. So like private chefing. Um, well, uh, like ad hoc catering and then um, still doing my day job. And I was very lucky. Uh, the Italian Cultural Center at the time became one of my clients, clients very quickly mm -hmm. and asked me to cater this event. And a guy walked up to me and said, I need a chef. For wait, wait, my... wait. You, the Italian people, uh -huh. Italian Italian who? Italian Cultural Center. Cultural Center. Had you make an Italian food for them? Yeah, wow, yeah. that is an accomplishment. Uh, it, was, it was an interesting time and I was really into it. Um, yeah, you but must have been. So someone approached you. Someone approached me and mm -hmm. asked me to be his new chef of his new cafe in Sardinia. And this oh, right, like wow. simple tourist kind of thing. And I quit my job and off I went. To Sardinia. To Sardinia, yeah. Fantastic. And it was a wild time, really. I had no restaurant experience, no formal cooking experience, and I did not speak Italian. But <laughs> I learned all those <laughs> things. But once you do that, once you get through a thing like that, you're in, you're hooked. Yeah, and food's food, right? And I, food's I, food. My first um, head chef job was an Italian restaurant, oh. and everyone spoke Italian, and we spoke English. So all the, all the checks came in in Italian, everyone spoke Italian. Yeah, it's crazy, but you learn, right? Wow. Yeah, I mean, chicken's learn. still chicken, beef's still yeah, beef, Yeah, right? it was. Well, it was interesting because they were really courting a lot of American guests at the time. So it was some standard Italian things, lunch and dinner, um, but really playing up. Italians at the time were being very curious also to vacationing more in America and Vegas was very popular. So the owner wanted the names of all the salads to be Las Vegas names. It was really So from, really from that simple. place, sorry to interrupt you, from, from that place you went on to, to do a uh, formal so, training or more yes, restaurants? Yes, so I thought I'd better learn something. So I finished that situation and thought, okay, I want to do this, but I can't do it like this. So I went back to San Francisco, got mm -hmm. a simple job cooking for a college um, who had bought this gorgeous brownstone and they needed someone to come cook for their staff and students. So I did that while I researched cooking schools and eventually went to a Le Cordon Bleu program. Oh yeah? Mm -hmm. So how did you get into yachting then from there? Yachting is another um, very organic start. I was uh, catering in New York City this time. I'd moved myself to New York and- Because you set up your own catering company, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I had done that in, after Italy, I'd done it in California, multiple places, and then wanted to try New York. So I was in New York and an agent called me and said, we need someone with a security clearance. And I had cooked for some, um, <laughs> dignitaries and high net worth individuals before. 
So I had a low clearance and this agent called me and said, we need somebody to teach uh, the chefs on this yacht how to cook for Americans. So could you come in one day for like eight hours and go over the menu, teach the crew and you're off? Well, what happened is I got on board, only woman, mostly Filipino and some Serbian chefs. It was uh, Topaz, so a very large yacht, mm -hmm. uh, has since changed names. But at the time, I got on, taught everyone, and all of a sudden we left. They just left. They left port, left, and I thought, hey, I'm still on board. <laughs> I was here for the day. <laughs> so uh, head of staff came down and said, could you stay for two weeks? It was an amazing, amazing time. And I filed it away as, huh, maybe this is something interesting. Mm -hmm. And then it still took me several years and- Yeah, because you were telling me before where you got into the Oscars and all kinds of things, right? Yeah, and uh, in LA, as um, is very common, there were a lot of TV productions that needed food and so it was easy for me to jump in mm -hmm. on that front. I got a lot of work very quickly, which I was really lucky for. So Hollywood, with all the celebrities. A lot of Hollywood, um, many celebrities. Um, I've seen a lot of sound stages and um, a lot of interviews. Yeah, so um, you had a little taste of your in. Uh, so how did you actually get your first job out, going off and getting your SCTW and all that kind of stuff? How did, how did you do that? Um, actually, I was um, catering in Miami and someone called me and asked me if I could come on and do this one month for people who were vegan and gluten free. Okay, because you're kind of vegan yourself, vegan plus? Uh, I, I would say I'm vegan plus. Yeah. Um, I do have dairy sometimes, mm -hmm. um, but I align a lot to what you were talking about in your book, which is eating vegan most of the time, not yeah. just for health, but also for environmental reasons and to be considerate of this planet that we're all sharing. That's true. Um, and a lot of chefs have been talking about the idea of eating vegan most of the time while still indulging, and it really should be considered an indulgence, um, other yummy things like dairy and meat. Yeah, well, but, that's, that's what I like about it. But so yeah. you're in Miami. So I'm in Miami and I, I was asked to do this. It went great, I loved it. It was a really small boat, uh, 120 foot. Oh yeah. And there were just a handful of crew. We all got along great. We had such a good time, but I didn't know anything at the time. I didn't know about STCWs or anything. And actually it was the first mate who talked me through all the steps I needed to take um, to do it. And I did. Where did you do your course? Uh, Blue Water. Oh, Blue Water here in yeah, Fort Lauderdale. Yeah, Blue Water in Fort Lauderdale, exactly. And I was commuting from Miami to Fort Lauderdale to do it, uh, but it was totally worth it. I met also a lot of great people in the classes um, who we still follow each other and communicate. And yeah, you know, that's fantastic, isn't it? The network. Yeah, the network, and it really starts there. Uh, and yachting is really a small world because even though we're all over the world, we see each other's at marinas everywhere we go. Yeah, yeah everyone uh, knows who's on each other's boat, right? I was at Rybovich just a few weeks ago and I ran into that first mate who got me into yachting. Wow. And it was great to see him and say, hey, I, you know, I've been on all these boats now and I love this life and it's awesome. So which chef do you admire the most? Uh, in the States, there are several, but I would say uh, Jose Andres is the international chef mm -hmm. I admire the most because his approach to not just integrity of food wherever he is, but the way he feeds people and the way he looks at food, not just as an indulgence, but as respectful of nourishment. And I think that comes across in every project he's ever done, whether it's super high end or whether it's chilly in the middle of a disaster. He really walks the walk. Oh. And I appreciate that. Yeah. I find him absolutely inspirational. Fantastic. What a good answer, eh? Thanks. <laughs> but so, yeah, he's the top for me. So, um, you, 
Patricia, you've been doing this quite a while now, right? 14 years, 15 years, 14? Uh, I've been a chef 25, 25 years. 25 years, and yeah. how long in yachting? Uh, in yachting, full time, only three and a half. Three and a half. Yeah, but so I've been on a lot of boats. Been on a lot of boats, yeah. A lot of boats. So yeah. which ones do you prefer? Do you prefer for, um, private boats or charter boats? I prefer charter, yeah. absolutely. I love, I love the challenge. I love the unknown. I love the push. Mm -hmm. On charter, you get a different set of tastes every time and a different feeling of really, even if you are like the most cohesive crew out there, all kinds of different things come up, all different guest needs, all different weather challenges. And every time it's a new opportunity to work together and impress each other and and grow a bit more with his team right? grow as a, as a team yeah. and also keep leveling up mm -hmm. because every time i'm faced with a new a new place a new port a new as i said tastes and preferences of the guests i get to face a blank page where i start writing that menu and some people love very elaborate breakfast. Some people don't want breakfast at all. So talk me through your day then. So how, okay. how do you do it? So let's say someone's chartering the boat, you've got two weeks, ideal situation, you get your preference list. What, what do you do from there? I first make a sample menu, a suggestion. Um, it, some people love it right out of the gate. Some people will go through many rounds of sending it back to me. And do you just go that with the captain and the, and the chief steward or is that straight to the... First thing I do is send it to the captain and the chief stew mm -hmm. just to make sure that maybe they're aware of something that I don't know, like a night off or an occasion, a birthday party, a wedding anniversary. Um, or sometimes it could be that, oh, you know, on day five of this eight day charter, we are going to be in the most perfect sunset position. So if you could elaborate on the cocktail hour canapes and push dinner later, for example. Um, it's always great to get their feedback. Uh, okay. You know, and the chief stews know a lot about what they'll be drinking. Yeah, that's and true. And it's fun to get some pairing involved. Match that up. Exactly. Yeah. So what's the next day? So you've got your menus back. So let's say the guests are happy with the menus. Okay. Uh, what do brokers you do next? Brokers happy, guests yeah, are happy. Everyone's happy because this is the be perfect charter, too. right? <laughs> oh, the perfect charter. Well, the perfect charter, then I can get into what can I get depending on where I am. So provisioning. So provisions. Is there anyone you use um, like locally here, like a big agent or, or anybody like that? Or do you prefer to get it yourself? Um, I prefer a mix and it really depends on where we are because there are plenty of opportunities when you're someplace like here in Fort Lauderdale mm -hmm. and uh, there is someone I use for gourmet goods. Um, his company is called Caviar Exclusive. Oh, yeah. He's a one man show. He can get outstanding things from all over the world. And that's here in Fort Lauderdale. He's here in Fort Lauderdale. Caviar goods. Caviar, goods? Caviar exclusive. Caviar exclusive. And he's he's so personalized. He knows a lot about what he's talking about. And he gets everything. So he gets meats, everything gourmet. Fish. So but this can, is your more um, special so items. Caviar, foie gras. foie gras. He can also get you know, A5 steaks. You wagyu's. Yeah, yeah, and I don't get any bulk items from him. Mm -hmm. I get really specialty. So where'd you go for your bulk items? So if I'm here and I have the time, I could go to Restaurant Depot or yep. I could place an order with Bush Brothers. Mm -hmm. I think Bush Brothers does a few things particularly well and I've tried a lot of vendors. Yeah. And Bush Brothers has packaging down its perfection. And and they're based in Florida, right? Bush they Brothers. are, yeah, they yeah. are. And they'll deliver right to the boat. No matter, as long as you're in the States, wherever you are, they will come. They they don't call you from the gate and say, oh, can you come meet me? No, they will come exactly to you. They really know what they're doing. Yeah, that's good. And so where are you getting your produce from? Produce? Well, if I have the time, Chef's Garden. Chef's Garden. I love it. I, I Not everything. You know, I'm not going to get my basic carrots from them. Although their Thumbelina and Dragon Carrots are outstanding. Uh, 
they grow slightly different things every year and certainly every season. And they're, they're here, they're in Davie, right? They're in Ohio. Oh, in Ohio. Oh, and, Ohio they, and they ship it and to And they you. ship it wherever you are. Wow, yeah. So if I'm in the Bahamas and I need them, I need to use a provisioner. Um, Shoreside Support Shoreside Support, is Tommy awesome. Baldwin. Yeah, <laughs> Tommy Baldwin. We're big fans. Yeah, we are. Um, I've used Owen Doyle in yeah, the past Owen, many times. He's a legend, right? He's been doing it for years. A long time. Yeah, I mean, Owen has saved me. Christmas Eve, special request. How do you get something on Christmas Eve so that I receive it on the 26th? But he made it happen. Well you done. Did. Well done, Owen Doyle. <laughs> um, these guys, like the, really the um, people who do that kind of support are make they the make it for difference. us, right? They, I mean, to go above and beyond like they do is fantastic. And we wouldn't be able to deliver what we can if it wasn't for those guys. So thanks very much. Not. We really do appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thank you, provisioners. You make our jobs possible. I mean, I was in the Bahamas for a lot of their lockdown. And yeah. There so were we times, left just before you before you guys, uh, right? We were there too. Yeah, and then we left that's just right. We were right. Our bus were very close. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I couldn't buy salt. I couldn't beg salt. Wow. I was standing outside of Fresh Market with a $100 bill. Please, please give me salt. No, I no. could not get any salt That's from crazy. anybody. Like it really got, you know, I had to refine soy sauce and start and tamari and um, dehydrated porcini and all other kinds of umami flavors. But those chowders yeah, I mean, did not get, essential, isn't it? Not get a lot of salt. And yes, yeah, salt is critical for lots of things, not just flavor enhancement, but dehydrating and pickling and marinades. Yeah, for sure, definitely. But, you know, part of the challenge. Mm -hmm. So, um, produce, we've done that, so fish, you got, you got a nice place of fish or you're kind of using fish, your- Fish, um, it depends. So if, like we're um, on this boat, uh, we are doing a New England charter and there's lots of local seafood at pretty much every port. Mm -hmm. But if there's time, my favorite absolute top fish person is Harbor Fish out of Portland, Maine. Oh, Harbor Fish. Harbor Fish. They will send 24 hours notice, um, except for Sundays, but they are outstanding. And they only sell what they what their fishermen bring in that day, right there. And they're called? And they're called Harbor Fish. Harbor Fish. Out of Portland, you, Maine. Portland, Maine. And, uh, you know, lots of people argue about lobster, oysters. For me, the colder the water, mm -hmm. the better the taste. And they have it down. You know, and there's not a lot of industry in these Maine waters, especially Casco Bay Islands and um, that, like far out of the coast, far not so far that we're in international water, but these fishermen really, even in November, and I mean cold, it's cold, but they get the most perfect oysters. Uh, Shabig Island oysters are my favorite, yeah. hard to get. Uh, they only produce a certain number every year, but when I'm lucky enough to get them, I think they're the best. Fantastic. So let's, we've got all the provisions on board now for our okay. perfect charter. Um, run me through a normal day. What, what time are you up? What time are you in the galley? <laughs> um, I'm not a morning person. So <laughs> I start my day. I need to be in that galley usually 5 a.m. I need to turn on the oven at 5 a.m. And do you make your own pastries and things like that for yes. breakfast? Yes. Um, so I do keep backup stocks of croissants, in but the nothing freezer. else. So, um, you know, Whole Foods has started selling these great small croissants. Yes, I've seen those. Um, yeah. They're you know, they're standard, but they're made with really nice French butter. They're super easy. Uh, it saves me, you know, two days of labor mm -hmm. because I try and in advance of a charter stock up on some things that help me get through it. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. So are there any tips and tricks to, to help you? Yeah, get sure. Ready? I mean, a typical charter day is so busy and full of unexpected requests that come up for sure uh and all kinds of other things that can just happen on a moving vessel mm -hmm. power issues water issues um crew needs all kinds of things and i find that keeping some really interesting sauces is the key so i make a lot of my own stock i start doing it weeks in advance if i can like right now i have a whole bin of al already just from making crew food and keeping bones and scraps of vegetables. I make stock pretty much every single day during a yard period. I freeze it all and I make all kinds of stock. Mm -hmm. 
um, mixed meat. Um, some of them are seasoned, some of them are not. But stocks with really interesting flavors are the key. Yeah, because you can just whip them out, add them to a cream exactly. or a different it's sauce, really, and off you go. You know, right? you can make a slurry out of you know all kinds of different binders. If somebody's gluten free, you can use dehydrated potato. You can use cornstarch, like in a lot of Asian dishes. Mm -hmm. um, there's all kinds of things. You know, quinoa flour, and now more than ever, there's all kinds of options. So if you can make a slurry, you have an outstanding stock, all different kinds, and then. When you travel around to all these places, you're going to the grocery store if you're lucky, and you can grab an unusual dehydrated chili or um, some cool, unusual mix with a sesame seed base. That's really my favorite bases because sesame seeds have that natural, not only uh, texture to the tongue, but um, kind of nice earthy taste. Yeah. And I love those stirred into sauces of all kinds. Um, and it also gives, you know, you can tell people it's sesame based and they feel better about what they're yeah, doing. Yeah, they feel better, yeah. right? So um, you up at, you say five in the five, morning. Well, I got to start by five, in, but yes. In the galley. So what do you do first? Who are you, who are you prepping for first? Uh, first, I'm doing breakfast. I'm, first, I'm starting the pastries and I really get into the bread baking on board. Mm -hmm. I like to offer interesting bread baskets at every meal. So do you have your own sourdoughs and things on board? I do. Actually, I'm quite lucky. Uh, my uncle, for about 20 years now, has had a sourdough starter, and he gave me some, dehydrated it, and I carry it with me pretty much everywhere I go. Wow. Um, and then every must time- must be fun at customs when you're trying to fly somewhere. <laughs> well, it's dehydrated, so, um, you know, it's just- rolled up yeah. um but i also every time i'm in italy they have outstanding commercial sourdough starter um called levito di madre and levito di madre sourdough starter and if you're in a pinch that will save the taste of if you show up and all of a sudden you've got to produce bread with no time to make sourdough starter yeah this produces beautiful taste and then once you have one dough you're Ready to, you're set for yeah, the season. Yeah, ready to go. You're ready to in, go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's de the dehydrated starter is absolutely a game changer. Fantastic. I'm gonna have to try that. I'm gonna look yeah, for it. Yeah, I'll give you some. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thank so, my uncle. So, who do you do? Um, you so you do breakfast first for so guests. So breakfast, right? So. Well, first I try and make and thank you Thermomix. Without a Thermomix, I would not get along. In yeah, my I day. love my Thermomix. So Thermomix good, is a, is the only machine worth having in the galley. When you're short on space, for me, that's the only thing worth having. Mm -hmm. And I, thanks to Thermomix, I usually can knock out nine different bread doughs but before 6 a.m. I just, you know, set them out in their bowls, you know, with their labels, and then throughout the day, um, bake off and mix as needed. And mm -hmm. they just stay on the counter ready to go. That's fantastic, yeah. Yeah, Thermomix, So who's, thank who God. gets who gets breakfast first, crew or? Um, I always send down crew breakfast by seven. By seven. And then it depends, you know, all guests are different as you know. So some, I've had guests who meet me in the galley at 10 to five. Yeah, I've had that. And are like, <laughs> hi, good morning, yeah. yeah. And, um, <laughs> and those are the days I wish I drank coffee. And then, um, <laughs> You know, you, ha you have guests who get up late or sometimes they love to go out and do an excursion before breakfast mm -hmm. and sometimes breakfast is later. So I prep all of the things for guests, um, pastries at the ready, fruit platters, um, omelet station things, it, you know, just off to the side so that should an order come in, I'm ready. I par bake, I bake bacon, I par bake it all yeah. and then just crisp it at the last moment. Mm -hmm. Um, otherwise, it's just too much, you know. Yeah, it is. Moment. It's that oven space, right? You need yeah. that oven space. So I need the it. oven space, but I also need the burner space. I can't allocate all that time and grease in the air. So I try and knock all that stuff out and crew breakfast before 7 a.m. For 7, yeah. And then um, if breakfast orders roll in, I get straight into that. Otherwise, I'm immediately prepping crew lunch and guest desserts. And then the day continues. The day continues. Then it, then Do you have any going. kind of like ritual or like music or anything you listen to in the galley to kind of keep you going? Uh, yes, absolutely. As anyone who's ever been on a boat with me before can tell you, 
music absolutely keeps me going. Yeah, well, I saw your, um, I've got your playlist actually oh, from the last you. edition. Yeah, it's um, really good. Thanks. Yeah, Such that really, mix. it yeah. is a big mix. Um, I like to start the day with classical music. Um, oh, right. So you feel I love posh. cello. I love violin. Uh, so you kind of dance to it. I can imagine you like. I dance around a lot <laughs> in the galley and uh, sometimes to the dismay of should the captain be right above me to the captain, I sing in the galley. Oh, you're a, a singer. I am. Um, you know, some people sing in their car and the yeah, shower. Yeah, I'm, I'm I sing in my car. Okay, well, I sing in the galley and I'm not a singer, but uh, it doesn't stop me. No, and you they know? shouldn't. No, you, you should know, let it, that out, you know. Actually, it is... It's kind of a no-brainer stress stress reliever, and it's bonding because crew are walking by all the time. Who knows what's happening in their day on other parts parts of the boat? Mm -hmm. I don't know about. I'm not privy to. But sometimes one song or my own happiness, like doing my thing, but being in that moment with music, is infectious. And then other people are like, "Oh, well, whatever happened back there? It doesn't matter now because." We're singing Donna Summer or whatever. Yeah, you know right. what I mean? That's or an interesting point. How, how do you deal with other crew members? Like, uh, uh, do you get along with them? Do you, you take... For the most part, not always. Mm -hmm. You know, it's high stress. It's um, often very international uh, and all kinds of different ages and backgrounds. And not everyone is a fit. That's just life. Yeah, that but is. Yeah. You... And there's only a small number of people on a boat, generally, right? So if there's a yeah. little bit of friction, it can it can build up, right? You know, um, nobody's perfect, but I um, have found over the last few years and several boats that what works for me is, as I said, music is critical, mm -hmm. but also uh, and everyone is going to think I'm so hokey, but I put <laughs> post-it notes over my bed that say, um, you know, uh, your best is good enough or like um, affirmations. Yeah, yeah, affirmations and also things that remind me that other people's stress I can listen to, but I don't have to participate in. Yeah, you don't need to pick those bags up, right? Yeah. Just have a look inside, yeah. tell them it's going to be okay. Well, yeah, That's and I bike. find that the chef no matter where i am and this has been true my whole career mm -hmm. probably for you as well is also treated like the classic bartender oh People yeah want to come to the kitchen to the galley crew guests everybody and they want to talk to you about whatever is bothering them yeah for on sure. vessel like off an agony vessel. Arm, right and to get a cup of tea or coffee, sit down. So let me tell you about this. <laughs> well, luckily there are, there are no seats in the galley. There are no <laughs> stools. There are no seats. Keep it moving. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm happy to. I'm I'm happy to listen. But sometimes when you're in such a small space, it's hard not to want to help and participate. Mm -hmm. um, you you even invested with, right? even you with good intentions. It's a mistake. It's a hundred percent always a mistake. It is. Just listen and do not get involved. <laughs> Just. Listen to everybody equally. Like my tag line, what I say to people mm -hmm. is, I'm always here to listen, but I cannot help you. You know, if you want to listen, yeah, I mean, it's a lot I'm to take 100% on, isn't it, with for everybody. it. But yeah, because you also don't know, as I said, so much goes on in a vessel that we in the galley can be completely unaware of. And whatever we hear going on in the radio is like a small little piece of what's actually happening in everyone's world. Just like for everyone else, they can't know what's happening in the galley. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, only we know, you know, I lost the burners or the oven's overheated or, oh shit, the fire alarm went off or, you know, and nobody's in the bridge. So the general alarm's gonna go off. We better fix this. You know, um, <laughs> it's, I find that uh, n compassion is, um, a great way to keep like going with crew and create that bond, um, but don't get involved. What do you like to do on time off or like after a charter? So charters dropped off, uh, drop, drop off day routine. What, what, what's your routine? What do you like to do? Um, drop off day is still pretty busy mm -hmm. because I need to deep clean the galley, clean the fridges, take the hood apart, clean the ovens, do an inventory, review what's next. And often I still have to feed the crew. Yeah. And you uh, do all that on a, on a drop off day. That's a, that's a normal yeah, routine. Yeah, absolutely. I have to do it immediately because um, a busy charter boat, guests 
could be coming the next day. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have 24 hours, sometimes 48 to flip it. Uh, but depending on where you are, all that time is taken up trying to get provisions yeah. and menu approvals and all kinds of things like that. Yeah, I, mean, I was on Excellence for two years and yeah. we often did two day turnarounds, three day turnarounds. Yeah. And you just gotta, you G gotta roll. G3 was very, very busy. Yeah. Yeah, 18 plus charters a season, very busy. Yeah, very busy. So I, I learned um, how to stay ahead as best possible. And how do you deal with, with your mental health and the stress of it all? Um, well, as I said, music helps, but really having a great crew that you make a big effort to interact with, um, not just how's your day going, but hey, what kind of music do you like? Because I'm going to play it in the galley. And if you see, I, I always try and get chefs um, to talk to their crew. Like whenever chefs are asking me things like this, I try and get them to say, not only when's your birthday, but what's your favorite meal or when you're stressed out, what makes you feel better? Or, you know, those kinds of things that you can just casually ask and then put them in your rotation, plan on them, let them like pop up through the week unexpectedly and people get excited. Yeah, that's kind of, do you do a rotation menus for crew? I do. I try and get the crew to tell me their favorite like four meals mm -hmm. and then I rotate through them and inevitably favorite meals also have a story behind them. Yeah. So then while they're eating this, someone can say, oh, this is the thing I asked for. And the last time I had this was when I went to this place. And then people get to share something about themselves and it's a happy time. You know, food doesn't, um, as we all know, just provide nourishment, but it is. Um, it's the memories, it's, isn't it? Isn't it's it? a memory. It's like. Um, happy times together and it's also encouraging and exciting like i ate this when i was in thailand oh i've never been to thailand you should go and you should go to this place and oh if you go i'll link you with this person and then your world gets bigger and uh happier and richer and richer so, yeah absolutely. talking about travel where, where have you traveled what, what's been an, an outstanding place that you've um been to? i have been going to italy for a really long time and i keep going back and actually i hope that uh soon i'll be able to um, buy a little farm there mm -hmm. and cook for my friends and family and have a, a small spot where even some random traveler who i might run across i would invite over like those early san francisco spaghetti days going all the way back full circle maybe a little more than spaghetti yeah that sounds awesome yeah um, so do, you, I, do you do anything do you, sorry do you do anything in your spare time your time off go an exercise routine or something um, you like to do i yeah there are lots of things i'd like to do i don't always get to and it's a challenge um i'm 50 and i'm often one of the older people on board mm -hmm. sometimes the captain is younger than me sometimes a little bit older yeah i've done a maybe. few boats where i'm older than the captain yeah, yeah. and um, something i think that people especially chefs who have dedicated so much time day in day out and all their travel and all their extra time to furthering being a chef can neglect workouts and it's also a stress reliever if you say so i try and do a little bit of yoga yeah. in my cabin and um i stretch in the shower so i always take a shower after my day at the end of the day because i don't want to get into bed smelling like food yeah right so in Who the does? shower i try and do some really like simple stretches so i do you know um not down with dog <laughs> there's, there's never a shower going to be on board no, big right. enough for that but no but uh you know like rotate shoulder rotations elbow stretches wrist certainly hip mobility um and it kills two birds with one stone yeah definitely know? it's yeah. good to stretch in the shower right because of the hot water and stuff yeah like that. it's great yeah and i've then... started doing um saunas recently oh yeah nice. so you do That's like 10 nice minutes habit. in minute out and and yeah okay. stresses the body and it's meant to be really good for you oh yeah for um, your cardiovascular i've heard that um doing the cryo system is also great oh like when they freeze you yeah 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 um it's supposed to be really rejuvenating i haven't been able to do it yet but i think it'd be great for chefs sounds cold on days off sounds well really cold. but it also i probably really helps with inflammation yeah, which we all well. get mm -hmm. you know repetitive movement exercises are a common issue for chefs yeah it's true and standing on your feet all day 
boat move in. Yeah, if yeah. there's um, if there are things that we could put into our rotation, I think that'd be a good one. But yeah, I yeah. love um, I love kickboxing. Kickboxing, I love wow. Roller skating. I love. Um, I'm not a runner. I wish I was because that I think I always think that would be the perfect yacht crew workout. Yeah, I love to run. Yeah. And I've done it a lot. Yeah, whenever uh, the boat's you know got some time off in the morning, I'll, I'll go for a run. Yeah, if you're even you know if you get up early enough and the guests aren't up yet, and you. Oh, can, I don't know about on charter. If you can schedule <laughs> the time, I mean, I know somebody. I knew a deck who his shift started at five, like mine. He would get up at four every single day to get in like a intense half an hour workout. Uh, yeah, that's intense. Right? And it was impressive. Uh, but then that's also something that I wouldn't work out with him in the morning because I'm way too busy. But when we were off and at anchor, we'd work out together and get other people involved. And then we got a little yoga group going together. Yeah. And that kind of thing not only keeps each other fit and connected, but a lot of yachties, I think, fall to excessive drinking. And when you have other things that you do together than just drinking, mm -hmm. it's um, it's great to keep it healthy. It is definitely great to keep it healthy. Yeah. So, um, Patricia, you've worked on land and in sea. Which okay. which one's your favorite? Which which one do you sea. enjoy the most? Sea. Hundred percent. Yeah. It's challenging. Um, it is. It makes me have to be a lot more organized than um, I would normally be on land and it has makes me have to look ahead. I mean, I was a private chef and a caterer for a long time. I'm used to being organized. I'm used to having plan Bs. Yachting is a different level. So you've cooked Absolutely. for some fantastic people, right? I have. Because you've done land stuff and you were telling me about the Oscars and things like that. Do you want to name drop a couple of people you've cooked for? Um, I have, um, because I worked for Wolfgang Puck and did catering for him, mm -hmm. um, I was cooking through his catering company um, for the Governor's Ball of the Oscars and many other big award shows. Um, I worked for MTV doing the movie awards and the video awards um, where you, I'm exposed to um, up close and personal with many, and I've certainly cooked in many celebrity homes as well um, in LA. Uh, and otherwise, a lot of ultra high net worth individuals and some politicians. Wow, that sounds like uh, you've made some great memories. I have. Are there yeah, any that stand out to you? Um, yes, I was one of the chefs hired to cook for a former. Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon many years ago in Los Angeles. And I, even though I'm not a big meat eater, I think I developed other skills that made me a pretty famous meat focused chef. And so I was often called in to do very large events. Um, I've, I've worked meat stations for up to 5,000 people. Wow. That's um, a lot of people. With a lot of high stakes. And uh, I when I did this party for um, this donor and um, Prime Minister Sharon, it was so fascinating to see all the different um, groups that come together for an event like that. Because we certainly had local police, LA County. We had uh, state police. There were Secret Service. There were other members of the government. There were Israeli um, government officials, defense officials, um, Mossad agents. And it was really fascinating to see the organization and the um, innate kind of routines that are in place for events like that, that everybody just understands. Yeah. And the, my best memory though, is I used to drive around this very old Volvo station wagon. I'm a huge fan of Volvos and they are workhorses. And I was driving around this old Volvo station wagon and to get to that event, I drive up and uh, one US, um, US protection service person and one Israeli took my car, they took it apart completely, completely took it apart oh, wow. for safety's sake. And not just, you know, I've been many places where they, they check for the bombs, they have the dogs, they have the mirrors, but 
this, they took it apart. And at the end of the night, when I get back and they hand me my keys and they, somebody in a golf cart brings you to your car, they bring me to my car, it was perfect. It was better than any mechanic I'd ever been to. They did the best job. If you yeah. could cook for anybody, past or present, dead or alive, who would you cook for and what would you cook? Um, well, instinctually, I would cook for my dad. He passed away a few years ago. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, that's okay, thank you. Um, and I got a lot of inspiration from family events and he took such pride in cooking what he knew under any circumstances. I'm an army brat, we moved around quite a lot and he really always made traditional family things that I still make for my friends, my family when I can and I make on board. Uh, they're great comfort things and people love them. Yeah, what's uh, your favorite comfort food? Uh, I really love soup. Soup. Yeah. Oh yeah. What soup kind of is soup? my favorite thing to make. It's my favorite thing to eat. Uh, every kind of soup. That's the thing about soup, yeah, right? right? Soup can be um, so simple and basic, right? Think about court bouillon or um, you know consomme. Takes some refining, but at the heart of it is very simple. Yeah, I used to have a friend when I was in the army that used to say, "Soup is a solution to all problems." Oh, and I so would like that person. So we would often sit down and have soup, and then afterwards, you know, things aren't so bad, right? And soup, you you have to be slow when you're you you can't just you know you could take a shot of soup and <laughs> and run away, but it's not enjoyable and it's not going to do much for you. Soup. Um, you can work on for half an hour, you can work on for three days, and it's all over the world. And with very um, simple changes, you can make a whole different thing. And so nutritious as well. And, right? Yeah, and really nutritious. Um, I have some Vietnamese family, and the way they approach soup like pho is the bones of it are so similar to ramen or to, um, chicken broth, you know, and matzo ball soup, but the starch changes and the herbs change. Mm -hmm. And I find it so fascinating how, you know, cilantro instead of oregano can produce something completely different. Yeah. I, do you I see any, it. do you notice any food trends that are happening, like from charter guests or from crew, things that you're not starting to see more and more people I, requesting? Um, what I see a lot of requests, um, of course, a lot of people are very carb conscious, um, although that is starting to abate. It's not as much as the last few years. I'm getting less requests for carb alternatives, but what I am getting a lot of is um, a lot of Asian food. Asian food, yeah. Yeah, in general, not just everybody wants sushi, everybody wants sashimi. But well, I nice to see ramen and things like that, right? Ramen, but also um, a lot dumplings of all kinds have yeah, been very popular. I've been cooking a lot of dumplings lately. Yeah, um, a lot of Indian food has been a big request. So really, the continent in general, not, you know, people have been really Japanese focused or Thai focused the last several years. But I've had requests for lumpia or um, crispy pata, Filipino dishes. Um, Malaysian food with really interesting curries and as I said Indian um, those requests are coming up more and more and they really do also reflect the international kinds of guests that we get yeah. and the crew yeah right. I'm yet to be on a boat where the crew doesn't love every kind of curry mm -hmm. curry is always a big yeah, uh, big winner really, for curry it really is it? all kinds of curry I, I would like to say if you ask me that who would I cook for again yeah um, I mean, I still mean it about my father, but because I think he'd be pleased where I've arrived. But I would say Jose Andres because I would like to give back. So um, who are the new up and coming chefs that you see in the industry? Who do you think is um, kind of hot right now and, and doing well? I think what we're going to see a lot more of are older chefs, chefs my age and even more, I think because of COVID and the global climate of lockdowns, a lot of restaurants shut down and there's mm -hmm. a lot of really talented chefs who never considered yachting before, who have a ton of experience, know absolutely how to handle stress, have worked in all kinds of international cuisines. And I think they're looking at 
yachting as not only a way to further their career and and continue to be out in the world, but also um, get to work with more interna international clients and keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I never really thought of that. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's really interesting. Um, if you could give some advice to yourself when you first started yachting, you go back and give yourself some hints and tips, what, what would you say? Uh, don't bring on a lot of clothes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cut the clothes, cut the toiletries, you're never going out. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great answer. Yeah, and always bring, and bring a band. Um, you know, a workout band, a reflection band. Um, a, uh, I use a yoga strap mm -hmm. to help me stretch. Even in my cabin, there's not a lot of room, but I try and elevate my feet at night and um, one of the things I do simultaneously, you know, multitasking all of our time, is I will stretch the back of my heels, but also the hamstrings. And at the same time, I'm stretching my lower back. And you can do that with just a few inches above your head. Yeah, well, I used to have a band um, on Excellence and I would do a little workouts in my room. With yeah. The band. And yeah, it's just really clever and, and small. So easy, exactly. And, and you easy can fit that into you. anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, what's give me like tell me about your your latest endeavor what's the future for Patricia Clark um, well um, I want to keep doing yachting for several years but simultaneously I'd like to get this little farm going in Italy mm -hmm. and part of that allows me to not only grow my own food which I used to do a lot of when I worked in California do you think you would do that on boats I'd like to do that on boats I'd like to see that more not just from myself and other chefs but in yachting in general because yachts are primed for that yeah they have so much sun exposure um they, their own environment as they, well right they're in a great environment um really lots of natural wind natural yeasts um often when we're at ports we get a lot of um, bees coming around every crossing i see tons of bees all over the boat they're really attracted to it and i think they're there is a real potential for lots of boats to set up not just herb gardens in your window, but grow actual produce on your sun deck or, you know, um, even a vertical garden um, on any of the bridge deck aft, main deck aft, even along the bow, you could have something. Yeah, you and could. And I'd yeah. like to see a lot more of that and I'd like to participate in it. Um, we've just bought for the, the place that I work at uh, an urban cultivator, and it looks like a little under counter fridge. But it's actually a cultivator. You put water in, it hooks up to the water system. Interesting. And it creates the perfect environment for growing micro herbs. And, but you can grow carrots in there and, and lettuce and everything. Oh, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Hopefully it comes soon and I'll uh, get, it, get it hooked up. I'd love to see a veggies. video of that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have to invite you. So thanks so much for coming today uh, and uh, speaking you. to me here at LMC. Um, where, how can people get hold of you or find out where your food pictures are and things like that? Uh, well, I have an Instagram um, and that is all five senses. So that's all five senses. The words all together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All five senses. Awesome. Thank you. Nice to see you well, again. Thank you. See Thanks you for soon. having me. All right. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time for more Chefy content on Triton News.